Wow, amen. After that, I feel ready to worship, don't you? Welcome to Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. Uh, we are so happy to welcome you this morning, both here in the sanctuary, those who are with us in this earliest of our four uh, worship services here on Sunday at Christ of the Hills, all of them limited to 50 folks, all of them following the protocols. I see you all are wearing your mask, and we must do that throughout the entire service while we're here, anytime we're in the building right now, and uh, separated and social distanced. And so we appreciate you so much for following all those protocols. Calling in your registration for uh, joining us in these services is extremely important. And thank you for doing that. Remember to do that every Monday morning uh, starting at uh, 8 o'clock. And we also welcome, of course, those who are joining us uh, online, either through Facebook or YouTube. We're so happy that you are joining us as well. And uh, we want to uh, be a blessing to all of those who are tuned in to be with us today as we worship together. These are 30-minute worship services, so we go very quickly. However, I want to call to your attention that our... Uh, Bulletin and announcements are getting bigger as we get toward the end of the year. A lot going on. You'll hear about some of those things. Let me just mention one of them, and that is our bishop, Bishop Muller, has called Arkansas United Methodist to a time of special prayer for our nation today at 5 o'clock. He, he, he wants us all to pause and pray for our nation at 5 o'clock today. There are instructions. If you would like to join the Arkansas Conference in a Zoom call, there are instructions in the email that was sent out to you in the bulletin materials that we have here, the announcements as to how to access that on Facebook at the Arkansas United Methodist site. And uh, please look over that if you want to have a time of guided prayer with Bishop Muller leading. But even if not, if you just want to pause at 5 o'clock and pray for our nation, uh, our Arkansas United Methodist Conference is being called to do this today. So again, welcome to our worship today, and Reverend Sheila is going to come and lead us now in a call to worship. Good morning. Our call to worship is Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we remember this this week as we go throughout our days. I want to lift up before our joys and concerns, I want to lift up some um, ministry opportunities for all of you. And again, these are listed in this bulletin. Uh, there's home communion delivery and also prayer chapel. Lance Emerson is the contact person for those. And uh, we have people that take care of home communion delivery on our communion uh, Sundays. And we would love to have more people uh, that would be able to do that. And so if you're interested, please contact Lance. There's more information here in the, in the bulletin about that. Also, our prayer chapel, which is right back there behind everybody, we have people that come every day and pray for the people that are on our prayer list. So if you would like to be part of that ministry, you can contact Lance as well, and he'll be glad to give you some more information on that. The other service that I want to talk about is our memorial service ushers. Of course, right now, we haven't had a whole lot of, of memorial services inside the church. But when we get started with that again, we will need some more help with our being our ushers. And so if you're interested in that, please contact Kathy Brackey at the office, and she would give you information about how you can help with that ministry as well. Our joys and concerns, of course, are listed in our bulletin, and I want to lift up uh, several here for you. Our sanctuary altar flowers are given to the glory of God by Linda and Murphy Tetley in celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary, and by Chauncey and Kathy Townsend in celebration of their 52nd wedding anniversary. The Welcome Center flowers are given to the glory of God by Jerry and Marina Young in celebration of their 25th wedding anniversary. We want to uh, continue to extend our sympathy to former member Joy Solomon on the death of her husband, Lee Solomon, to Gordon and Roxana Jean on the death of Roxana's uncle, Floyd Bergeau, and to Kirk and Betty McKee on the death of Kirk's brother-in-law, Bill Monken. And then we also want to lift up that David Kent is in the hospital at UAMS, and so we want to remember him. Um, also, Renee, his wife, is, is recovering at home from a car accident. And then Nyla Morgan is also at home recovering from her surgery. So we want to continue to remember these people in our prayers this week. Let us pray. 
Lord, as we gather here and at home for worship, we open ourselves to what you want to tell us today, what you want us to hear, and what you want us to learn. We pray for others who want to know you, and we ask for courage as we reach out to them and help them have a relationship with you. We pray for those who are hurting, sick, and grieving. We pray for those who are lonely and think that no one cares about them. Help them feel your presence with them, as well as the presence of their friends and family. We know that we need each other for support and encouragement, and we pray that we are able to lift their spirits and give them much-needed comfort. In this new school year, we continue to pray for students, teachers, parents, administrators, and staff. Things are different this year for them. Some are in school buildings, and some are at home, and all of them need our prayers. Bless them as they work and learn together. We pray that they will have patience and understanding as they face changes and challenges, and we celebrate with them as they accomplish their goals. As we continue our worship, we pray for those who give their time and talents for our worship. So many people participate in getting things ready, and all of them are important to the life of this church, and we're so thankful for their ministry. As we continue to worship today, we lift up all of these prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There's folks building homes as sweet as can be. They're leveling their yards and planting their trees. But my earthly home, I'll just let it be. Lord Jesus is building a mansion for me. Mansion for me, a mansion for me. Built by my Lord beyond Calvary, but my earthly home, I'll just let it be. Lord Jesus is building a mansion for me. Each day I am getting more ready to go. I'm cleansing my fence more whiter than snow. I'm packing my troubles. I'm bound with his love, getting ready to move to heaven above. Mansion for me, a mansion for me, built by my Lord beyond Calvary. But my earthly home, I'll just let it be. Lord Jesus is building a mansion for me. To you who have homes on this earth below, and drive and find cars wherever you go, there's coming a time when we'll all pass away. Get ready to move with me on that day. Mansion for me, a mansion for me. Built by my Lord beyond Calvary. But my earthly home, I'll just let it be. Lord Jesus is building a mansion for me. Dale and Sandy.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8. I'll be reading starting at verse 26. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is again great to see you here today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our source and supplier of our every need. Your word says that we should honor you by returning the first fruits of our increase. And Lord, this morning, please accept our tithes and offerings as an act of worship to you. We ask that you multiply these offerings for the effective growth of your kingdom. May the Holy Spirit dwell in our hearts through faith so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses understanding. May we be filled with all the fullness of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, now this is the second message in a series that I'm calling Outshine. 
My initial inspiration for that series being the uh, advertising campaign initiated some years ago by uh, IBM called Out Think. The message to its potential customers was very clear. Our products can help you outthink uh, competition, outthink limits, outthink any obstacles that may hold you back, and so forth. So the word outthink was the central theme to which were attached modifiers. Christians, however, I think, are not called so much to outthink. That's not our central theme, is it? We may not all have the capacity of, say, a C.S. Lewis or some luminary of the faith uh, intellectually, but we do all have the capacity to so be with Jesus that we outshine, that we shine forth in reflection of Christ. So this series is intended to highlight some of the stories of the earliest luminaries of the faith in the book of Acts. Last week we saw Peter and John outshine ordinary. The religious elite were amazed that these supposedly ordinary men from the Galilee, just fishermen from the Galilee, uh, were having so much influence in Jerusalem. And so they were able to outshine ordinary. Now in today's text, which uh, Reverend Sheila just read for us, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch show us, I think, how to outshine hesitancy. Now, if it wasn't for the COVID epidemic, uh, I would uh, have you read from the Pew Bible right now because I want you to be a detective. I want you to solve a puzzle. But we don't have Pew Bibles there, so we're not passing those germs around because of the pandemic. So listen very carefully to the text. I'm going to read it as Reverend Sheila read it with the verses, okay? And this is also printed in your order of worship if you have that with you. Here's verse 36, the last two verses that she read. Verse 36, as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Now here's verse 38. He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, I just read verses 36 and 38. You may think I skipped verse 37. But this is the actual way that the NRSV, which is your pew Bible, and the one that Reverend Sheila just read from, uh, reads without verse 37. And most modern English translations do the same thing. So in a where's Waldo kind of way, we're going to ask the question, what happened to verse 37? It's not there. Did our translators forget it? Did they leave it out? And the answer to those questions is no, they did not forget it. But yes, they did leave it out. Boy, Dale, that just gives you a halo. The light. If you need to move over, you feel free to. That looks uncomfortable. Where was I? Okay, they did not forget verse 37, but they did leave it out. There's a footnote at the bottom of the page that reads this way. Other ancient authorities add all or most of verse 37. So let's read the passage again, and this time I'm going to include verse 37. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Now here's verse 37. And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now we pick up again where modern translations continue. He commanded the chariot to stop and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Now reading the passage with verse 37 makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It provides a direct answer to the eunuch's question. Read without verse 37, the story leaps over the answer to the action and eliminates all hesitancy. So what's going on here? Evidently, some ancient Christians thought Philip should not just jump right down into that water. That eunuch first needs to answer the question. Don't stop that chariot yet, Philip. Have that man answer 
or have that man have an answer to his question. Insist that he speak the confession before you get down there and get him wet. That makes sense, right? There's a problem, though. Most ancient versions, and by far the best witnesses to the earliest transmissions of the text, do not include what has come to us as verse 37. This includes the three most ancient and best codexed manuscripts from the uh, 4th and early 5th century, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus. Verse 37 makes no appearance in any of those or in any text prior to the late 6th century, almost the 7th century. So verse 37 is dubious. The reasons for excluding it from the text actually outweigh the reasons for including it. There is much to say here, as you can imagine. Were I standing at the lectern over in the lecture room rather than a pulpit, I would relish the opportunity. Even if I had an hour for service, I would relish the opportunity to do that. But that's not the case, so I want to hasten to my point in case I'm losing you with textual matters. The passage, as it reads in most modern versions, including our pew Bibles, upholds the outshine hesitancy moment I want us to consider. This passage in its original form offers a kind of Nike theology. Just do it. You have asked what hinders you from being baptized. Why, sir, your question tells me you want to be baptized, so let's get you wet. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next Easter, right now, let's do it. Philip's action then outshines hesitancy. The words of verse 37 are a late scribal insertion in order to clarify meaning. And what it says makes perfect sense. As the church's liturgy developed, verbal confession becomes the uh, expectation prior to baptism. Sure, they thought confession is implied in the eunuch's desire to be baptized, but we want it more than implied. We want it stated emphatically. So these scribes wrestled with what they saw as undue haste in the way Luke originally wrote the story in the book of Acts. So that this addition is consistent with what was 6th century, 7th century church practice. And what came to be known as verse 37 wedged its way into the early text. The absence of hesitancy in the story as Luke told it, some scribe thought, needed to be amended, lest it give the impression that, you know, nothing is necessary prior to being baptized. Uh, surely something is necessary, so let's spell it out. So the hasty sequence of Acts chapter 8 is just too easy, they thought. We need a certain hesitancy and not rush so much. Now, in today's church, the same debate still goes on in the 21st century. What is required for membership in the church? What's required for baptism? In some variation or another, in the ebb and flow through the long centuries of the church's history, the answer has gone back and forth between two extremes. One extreme is, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Answer, nothing. Let's get you wet. Welcome to the church of the risen Christ. That's what you see in the book of Acts. The other extreme more carefully guards the doorway into the church and sets forth any number of requirements. Verse 37 demands that confession be spelled out. No, before you can be baptized by the, in that water, say it. Say it all. We want to hear the words. There have been times when the prevailing wisdom of the church required much more than even that kind of a confession. A more extended process of learning catechism, pledging themselves to any number of expectations before we get you wet. This is not in our 21st century world without logic that spelled out expectations can lead to greater retention of, of committed ones. That, that fewer who are baptized as a doorway into the church will quickly exit out the back door of the church if they never really understood what their faith entailed. Why, come on, it may be said, civic clubs like Rotary and Lions and Kiwanis and even country clubs ask more of you to be a member. Surely the church should seek more as requirements uh, than a mere desire to join. Hesitancy is not such a bad thing, we might think. 
Let's not outshine hesitancy. No, let's utilize hesitancy in order to restrict entrance to the church to those who are very, very serious, those who are willing to count the cost before they embark upon the journey. And as I said, there is logic to this approach. And it's the same well-intended logic that gave birth to verse 37 in the late 6th century. Still, it is not how the church started in the book of Acts with 3,000 converts on the day of Pentecost and 5,000 converts then almost immediately in the time of Peter and John that we talked about last week. There were no time for classes and contracts and uh, their lack of hesitancy in no way damaged the church. It set the church on fire in the world, a fire that continues today. To be sure, it's not the textbook church growth formula in current days. Today I wonder if some churches might not add just not, not just verse 37's confession, but an entire chapter or two. You've asked what, what, uh, what do you need to be a church member and baptized? Let's not give anyone the impression that baptism and church membership are easy. No, let's not. Baptism and church membership, though, are spiritual acts of an excited faith. When one hears of Jesus Christ as the eunuch heard of Philip speak of Jesus Christ and their spirit responds with that excitement, that urge in itself to be baptized, and I'm talking about adult baptism here, becomes a promise. Our baptism is not an outthinking, but an outshining. Baptism is not a reward in exchange for having learned how to think about a creed or to think about a catechism followed by a pledge Baptism instead is a doorway, it's a promise, it's a portal to all the tomorrows which we will encounter on our faith journey as we grow. By outshining hesitancy, we are embracing opportunity. So when should I jump in is the question. It's an element in any of life's decisions, right? When to pop the question to one you love to commit as a spouse, Uh, when to refinance a home, Uh, when when to make a final decision on planning a vacation destination. And so many of our decisions, uh, we're waiting for that moment when when, uh, hesitancy is put aside and we jump in. And for those seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ, I think the best answer is what Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch. Jump in. The water is fine. And it is. Praise be to God, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, 30 minutes on the dot. We're getting good at this 30-minute stuff, aren't we? Thank you for being a part of our worship here in the sanctuary. Thank you. But thank you also, those who are watching online, for being a part of our worship at home. We want you there, and we want you safe. And we think we're doing everything possible to keep everyone here safe. I know you feel safe. And uh, you're distancing, you're wearing a mask. And right now, as, as the ushers lead you out the side door so you're not crossing with people who are coming for the next 30-minute service, just remember not to clump up uh, in case someone is slower than you are. Maintain that six-foot distance between families. We've got plenty of time to get you out onto the parking lot. And thank you for being a part of our worship this morning. Would you stand now for the benediction? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.